We are in the third week of our series. We're calling He Is, I Am. Before we get in, I want to remind you of our Make Him Known initiative. Uh, I know some of you are doing this. I really appreciate it. What we're asking you to do is every week leading up to Easter, so this week is your last week to do it, share on your social media uh, my sermons, any, that doesn't have to be my sermons, any sermons you like, share on social media. We also will post um, other things on our social media that you can share. What we want to do is make him known. We can never forget that there are people all over East Cobb and around the world who have never heard the name of Jesus. So will you join me this week especially in making him known and inviting people to worship with you wherever you're going to be worshiping next week, hopefully here, but if not, wherever you are, invite some people to join you. But we are in the third week of our series, He Is, I Am, where we are looking at uh, some of the I Am statements that, that Jesus made. And so basically what we're doing is we're spending four weeks trying to discover just who Jesus really is, right? It's just like if you went to a party and met someone for the first time. You would probably say a lot of I Am statements in that conversation, right? You might say, I am a banker, I am a teacher, I am a husband, I'm a mother, I'm a gamer, I'm a vegetarian. Whatever it is, you're probably going to say, I am a lot, right? I am statements tell us a lot about a person. And so Jesus' goal was not to confuse us about who he is. Jesus wanted to make it very clear exactly who he is and who he isn't. He wanted to make it very clear what his mission was. Right? There are a lot of people who have no idea, or very little idea of who Jesus is, and yet all they have to do to learn about him is read his word. And the I am statement we're going to read today, he spends a lot, amount, a lot of time <coughs> trying to exp explain exactly uh, who he is. But as we'll see... Even with him taking the time to explain it, many people didn't uh, get it or they choose not to believe it. And really nothing has changed, has it? There will be people all around the world who at some point in their lives will hear a sermon on the I am statements of Jesus and still not surrender their life to him. As I said, one third of people have never heard his name. And that includes here in East Cobb, folks. One third of the world believe in Jesus, and one-third of the world have heard the gospel of Christ, but have not responded to the gospel in a way that would follow Jesus. And I don't think it's a matter of misunderstanding, really. I don't think it's a misunderstanding. I mean, that might be an issue for some, but, but I think for most people, they can grasp what Jesus is saying. I think the issue really is the issue of, of choice, right? We have to choose. To follow Jesus. It is a choice that we make. Yeah. Right? You cannot be forced to follow Jesus. Parents hear that. You can't force your kids to follow Jesus, but you can teach them. Right? It's a choice. So today we're going to read from John chapter 10. So you can go there right now, John chapter 10. Now in week one we talked about I am the bread of life, right? And then last week we talked about I am the light of the world. You can find a link to those sermons on our website, gatheringatl.com. Today we're in John 10, and we're actually going to be looking at, at much of this chapter. So once you're there, you can just leave your Bible and your phone open to John chapter 10. Um, we're going to be going through a lot of the chapter, but I want to begin with the I Am statement for today. It's John chapter 10, verse 11. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life. For the sheep. Hear this again. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You, remember, you may remember a few weeks ago, we, we looked at how Jesus called us sheep, right? And he said in Matthew 10, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as, as doves. Maybe you remember that sermon. Right? Or maybe what you remember most about that sermon series is your pastor calling you dumb during that series. Uh, hope I didn't offend anyone. But we are sheep and sheep are dumb, right? We tend to put our heads down and just follow the, that green grass wherever it goes, even if it eats us off a cliff, right? 
And some of you have been over that cliff in your life. Like you kept your head down following your green grass, and next thing you know, you're falling over a cliff. Right? It may have been something that grew into an addiction that you never saw coming. Or, or maybe it was innocent teasing with a co-worker at the office that turned into an affair. Right? Some of you looked up from following your path only to discover you have walked off a cliff and the life you knew is over. That's what humans do, right? We are dumb creatures who choose to follow our animal instincts. It feels good. If it feels good, we want more of it, right? If it looks good, we want to be there. We're like toddlers in a department store, right? You try to keep them in the stroller, but they're pitching such a fit you let them out, right? And you tell them very clearly, do not run away. But because they're toddlers, it doesn't matter how clearly you tell them, they ain't listening, amen? They just wander off, right? You're looking at a nice tired dress, and the next thing you know, you're looking for a kid, right? My mom uh, has shared that when my brother and I were, were little, we, we did that, right? We were in a department store. I don't know where it was. We were in an apartment store, and we were looking at clothes. And, and my brother and I thought it would be hilarious uh, if we would uh, hide in one of those circular clothes uh, displays. I don't know what, those are, what the hangers are, you know, and they're circular. Uh, we thought it would be funny if we could hide in there. And so the, uh, the clothes were hanging there, and we got inside, and my mom could not see us at all. And it was hilarious until it wasn't. <laughs> Uh, didn't stay funny because my mom did not appreciate that at all. She thought she had lost us. But because we were just kids, we didn't know that getting inside that display was a bad idea. Right? It seemed okay to us. But very quickly, we realized our mistake. It's why God gave us parents. It's why God gave sheep shepherds. We'll talk a little more about today about our role as sheep, but our main focus for today is to look at what Jesus meant when he declared himself the good shepherd. The good news is Jesus spent this entire chapter explaining what he meant and its implications. And it wasn't until verse 11 that Jesus actually said, I am the good shepherd. But notice the very first word in verse 11. The first word in verse 11 is what? It's therefore. It's therefore. And so let me give you, let me teach you something today. When you see therefore in the Bible, you need to ask what came before the therefore. Okay? Always remember to ask what came before the therefore. So look at verses uh, 1 through 6 with me. Jesus said these words. Very truly I tell you, Pharisees. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all, uh, out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Now, because most of us don't own sheep or any livestock, uh, we probably uh, don't completely understand the reference he's making with the sheep and the pen and all that. See, many sheep back then, they would bring, uh, they would, the flock would be brought back for the night, brought back to town for the night. And there were these communal pens in town where multiple shepherds would keep their flock. And then one of the shepherds would either volunteer or be chosen to be the security guard for the evening. See, the pens, they, they had no, no door. And I mentioned this in the sermon a few weeks ago, but because there was no door or gate, the shepherd would have to sleep at the opening of the door. And so the only way anyone or anything was getting into that pen was literally over the shepherd's dead body. <clears throat> Therefore, if anyone or anything did get in by another means, it was a thief or a robber. The only thing that was meant to be inside that pen were the shepherd's flocks. Now, we'll come back to this passage in a little bit because there's a couple other things I want you to see. Before we do that, I do want to continue the chapter. Uh, the Pharisees, they were the professional Christians or professional Jews of the day. 
They were the professional Jews of the day, the ones who were the greatest Jews in, in their own opinions. But, uh, but they were the one that Jesus was talking to, right? And in chapter 9, if you look in chapter 9, Jesus healed a blind man. And the man was very quickly taken before the Pharisees. And the problem was that Jesus healed the blind man on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees knew that working on the Sabbath was a sin. It's one of the Ten Commandments, after all, right? God told us to keep the Sabbath holy. And so how could Jesus be, quote, unquote, working on the Sabbath? And so they began to argue about who exactly this Jesus guy might be. And while some thought the fact that he healed the man on a Sabbath meant he couldn't be from God because that's a sin, others thought that there was no way a sinner could have done what was done to that blind man. Some even went so far to argue that the man had never really been blind at all. They actually brought the man's parents in to ask them, is your son lying? And they, of course, said, no, he's not. And still the Pharisees could not see what was right in front of them. And so Jesus saw an opportunity. He began to speak to the Pharisees about spiritual blindness. And it's the conversation about spiritual blindness that leads directly into the conversation about shepherds and their sheep and their pen. The last verse in chapter 9 is, Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, so to the Pharisees, now that you, can, you claim that you can see, your guilt remains. And then the first verse in John chapter 10 is, very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. Now, y'all are fairly smart people, so it's probably not too difficult for you to connect the Pharisees' spiritual blindness to the one who enters the pen by climbing in some other way, right? They are in the, the pen, but they are not of the flock. But even worse than, not, than just not being a member of the flock, they are actively working to steal or kill the sheep who are in the flock. Jesus was looking directly at the Pharisees and telling them that they were crooks and not part of his flock. But the Pharisees, who again were spiritually blind, did not catch the connection. John even wrote in verse 6, Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. They just weren't getting it. Liam and I are... are um, big fans of the office. We have any office fans here this morning? Okay, the rest of y'all just need to get out. I mean, I'll tell you what. Uh, I, I, maybe I do need to explain the show. I didn't think I need to explain the show, but it's about a, a paper company, a little office in Scranton, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a mockumentary where they have a camera walking around filming this paper company. Uh, it's a great show, and, and there's one uh, episode in, uh, that has a scene in it that just cracks me up every time. Michael Scott... <coughs> Uh, played by Steve Carell, is the regional, uh, regional manager at that branch, right? He runs the branch, but he does not understand when he's told that the office is ending the year with a surplus, right? And so he, and, so, and, and because he has a surplus, he has to spend it by the end of the year, or next year will be taken off the budget. And he just doesn't understand it. So, so watch this clip. I'm, I, this is a guess, but I'm guessing there was probably a Pharisee that Jesus was talking to that was named Michael Scott, right? Uh, he wasn't a top Pharisee, but maybe a regional Pharisee. I don't know. But these Pharisees were like Michael Scott. They just weren't getting it. And so Jesus tried to explain it to them like they were eight years old. Look in verse 7. Jesus said, therefore, Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. And all who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And then this is when Jesus can look at them and see that they're still not getting it. So he explains it to them like they're five years old. Keep reading verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons, Jesus was southern, 
Uh, so when he sees the wolf coming, not coming, uh, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Each time Jesus explains himself, he's not only saying who he is, but also who the Pharisees were. He is a good shepherd. So if he is the good shepherd, who are the Pharisees? What are the Pharisees? Thieves? Robbers? The hired hands? Wolves? I mean, no matter how you cut it, Jesus was not saying very nice things about the Pharisees. Now, in this culture, shepherds and shepherding was widely understood. People knew what shepherds did, right? Shepherds protected their flocks. That's why throughout the Bible, uh, uh, you have this image of the shepherd being used to describe God and Jesus. Now, the most famous example is the 23rd Psalm, which says, The Lord is my shepherd, right? I shall not want. That means that the good shepherd provides for our every need. Psalm 77, 20 says, You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And side note there, uh, whose flock was it? It says, You led your people by the hand of Moses and Aaron. The flock belonged to God, okay? And the same is true for the flock of the good shepherd, but we're going to get to that in a little bit. And so while uh, shepherds were extremely low on the pecking order, everyone understood just how important shepherds were and what made someone a good shepherd. See, every good shepherd had three characteristics. They shared the same three characteristics. One, good shepherds are always vigilant. Two, good shepherds are fearless. And third, good shepherds have, very, have a very patient love for their flocks. They're vigilant, they're fearless, and they have a very patient love for their flocks. When you understand that, you understand why God is referred to as a shepherd throughout the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, the reference is tied to Jesus, God in the flesh. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus tells a story of the shepherd leaving behind the 99 sheep to go look for the one that is lost. In Matthew 9, Jesus is looking out at a large crowd, and, and Matthew writes, when, when he, Jesus, saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they, they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, when it comes to actual shepherds and actual sheep, sheep don't have much choice when it comes to who their shepherd will be, right? Sheep do not get to pick their shepherd. There is no shepherd draft day, all right? While actual sheep can't choose who they follow, the reality is you and I, we can. We get to pick our shepherd. And I want you to hear this. It doesn't have to be Jesus, right? But remember what your options are. It's the good shepherd or robbers, thieves, or wolves. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But it's your choice. It's your choice. But if you choose to submit and let Jesus be your shepherd, I want to let you know what we get out of that deal. Why is it better with Jesus as our shepherd? Exactly what does the good shepherd do for us? I want to look at four things every good uh, shepherd has with him at all times. The first thing a good shepherd has is what's called a scrip. A scrip, S-C-R-I-P. This was a bag made out of animal skin. It's, it's his lunch pail, basically. He'd have his little lunch in there, some olives, some cheese, things like that, a little bit of bread, maybe some fish, but that'd be his lunch. The second thing he had was a sling. Now, the most famous example of a shepherd's sling is probably the sling that David used to kill uh, the giant Goliath, right? But before that, he was a shepherd boy, and he used that sling to, to fight off lions and bears and all, oh my, you know? Uh, the sling was used to fight off anything that was trying to hurt the sheep. But that's actually not the only thing this thing was used for. I didn't know this when I started researching for this sermon. There were no sheep dogs in Palestine. So when the shepherd wanted to call wandering sheep back, he fitted a stone into the sling and then threw the stone so it would land just in front of the strange sheep's nose as a warning to turn back. Now hear me, only a really good shepherd can throw a rock like that. And this is what Jesus, our good shepherd, does for each of us. 
right? Those times when you come to realize that you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, those times when you realize you are somewhere you shouldn't be doing, that's a stone that Jesus is throwing right in front of you to get your attention. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, convicting us and calling us to come back. With Jesus as our, as our good shepherd, we become more sensitive to these callbacks. But we also don't wander away as often because we got it so good. The third thing a good shepherd had, had is a rod. His rod was this wooden club. It's pretty short. It had a, a lump of wood at the end, which would often be studded with, with nails. And this was the, the, the weapon that the shepherd would use against robbers and thieves. And they also used the rod to cor uh, correct the sheep, right? Spare the rod, spoil the child. That's what we're talking about here, right? Don't use that on your kid, kids, though. Don't, that's not good. So that's two weapons that the shepherd had, a rod and a staff. And while each were used as tools of correction, they were also used for defense. But not in the same way. Right? You would never use a sling for someone who was just a few feet away from you. Right? By the time you wound up your arm for the shot, the enemy would have already killed you. And so for close combat, the shepherd had his rod. See, the point is, a good shepherd not only has a sling and a rod, but he also knows how to use them. Right? There are folks who can protect us from some things, but no one can protect you from all things except a good shepherd. If I understand I am a sheep and completely defenseless against pretty much everything in the seen and unseen world, well, I'm going to stick with Jesus. But again, it's your choice. And the fourth thing a shepherd had was a staff. This is probably the most famous thing that a shepherd carries, right? It's the long wooden stick that's curved at the end, right, with a little crook at the end. Right? He, would, he, would lead, he would use the hook on the staff to, to grab the sheep. Uh, and to correct their position. But there was another use for the staff. At the end of the day, when the sheep were going into the pen or the fold, the shepherd would place his staff across the opening, not too high off the ground. And so the sheep would be forced to walk under the, 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 the staff. This is where we get the game Limbo from. That's not true, folks. Y'all are like, oh, really? That's not true. But the sheep would have to go underneath that staff. Why? Because as the sheep passed under the staff, the shepherd would examine it to see if it had received any kind of injury during the day. And if there was an injury, the shepherd would immediately tend to it. Now, you could argue that the shepherd did that because those sheep were dollar signs wearing wool coats, right? And you would be correct. The sheep were treasured because the shepherd saw and understood their worth. But it's also because a good shepherd truly loves his sheep. To this day in the Holy Land, shepherds still name their sheep. Now, they're not naming the sheep Bob, Larry, or Bridget, right? They're calling them like brown leg or, or black ear. But why do you name something? Why do you give a name to something? You name something that's important to you, right? It's of great importance. Right? I don't sit on my porch giving names to all the squirrels in my yard. Why? Because they're not worth anything and they should all be dead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, have, I have a lot. Uh, but we don't name them all. Right? We don't name every animal that we see. Why? Because they're not ours. There's a dog in the house next door to ours. I don't know his name, but I do know I didn't give him his name. Why? Because he is not mine. There is a true relationship between a good shepherd and his sheep. And the relationship is so tight that the sheep will not respond to any other shepherd's voice. They will only listen to their shepherd. Let me read you something. It's a little bit long, but just bear with me. It's written by H.V. Morton, who was a, a journalist. He's got famous for writing about uh, the discovery of King Tut's tomb. But he, he visited the, the, the Middle East, and he wrote this about shepherds. Sometimes he, the shepherd, talks to them in a loud sing-song voice using a weird language unlike anything I have ever heard in my life. The first time I heard this sheep and goat language, I was on the hills at the back of Jericho. 
A goat herd had descended into the valley and was mounting the slope of an opposite hill. When turning round, he saw his goats had remained behind to devour a rich patch of scrub. Lifting his voice, he spoke to the goats in a language that, that Pan must have spoken on the mountains of Greece. It was uncanny because there was nothing human about it. The words were animal sounds arranged in a kind of order. No sooner had he spoken that an answering bleat shivered, uh, shivered over the herd, and one or two of the animals turned their heads in his direction. But they did not obey him. The goat herd then called one word and gave a laughing kind of whinny. Immediately, a goat with a bell around his neck stopped eating and leaving the herd, trotted up the hill, across the valley, and up the opposite slopes. The man, accompanied by this animal, walked on and disappeared around the ledge of a rock. Very soon, a panic spread among the herd. They forgot to eat. They looked up for their shepherd, and he was not to be seen. They became conscious that their leader with the bell at his neck was no longer with them. From the distance came the strange laughing call of the shepherd, and at the sound of it, the entire herd stampeded into the hollow and leapt up the hill after him. And then W.M. Thompson wrote in his book, Land and the Book, the shepherd calls sharply from time to time to remind them, the sheep, of his presence. They know his voice and follow on. But if a stranger calls, they stop short, lift up their heads in alarm, and if it is repeated, they turn and flee because they know not the voice of a stranger. He then states that he repeated that experiment time and time and time again with the same result every time. So what's the point of those two quotes? Why does it matter? Sheep know their master's voice and the sheep and shepherds speak the same language. Now why does that matter? Because I can't tell you how many people just can't understand why they can't hear Jesus speaking in their lives. They don't understand what Jesus is wanting for them. And while there may be many reasons for this, one of the most prominent is the person does not have a close relationship with the good shepherd. And so when we don't recognize the good shepherd's voice or the language that he's speaking, we're more likely to follow someone or something other than Jesus. Do you remember the thing that Jesus said about hirelings? He was making it very clear that there was a big difference between a good shepherd and someone who was just hired to watch the sheep. <clears throat> Have you ever known someone who just was doing a job just for the money, right? Someone just had a job and they just did it for the money. How happy were they? Right? Maybe you're that person. I don't know. I mean, maybe are you happy going to a job that you don't really care about, but you keep going just because you need the money? I mean, countless people are living their lives like that right now. So how do you think they will respond when their company receives some negative press that isn't accurate at all? People who care about just their paycheck are probably not going to be the ones on the front lines defending their company. The same is true for hirelings. They were just working a job, and as long as nothing attacked the sheep, all was good. But if anything came for those sheep, the hireling, more likely than not, just ran away. Right? He deemed his life more important than the sheep. I mean, after all, sheep are just sheep. They're dumb. He's human. And so the sheep would be abandoned by the hired hand. But a good shepherd good shepherd dies for his sheep. Why would a shepherd do that? Love. That's it. Love. Shepherds, good shepherds, love their flock. Look at verses uh, 17 and 18. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No, hear this, church. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. He's saying it's my choice to lay it down. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. 
So this passage tells us so much about the good shepherd. Real quickly, it says, it tells us that everything Jesus did was done in obedience to God. It tells us that Jesus always saw the cross and glory together. Jesus understood exactly what hanging on the cross would accomplish for all of us. Third, it tells us that Jesus voluntarily chose the cross. Don't rush past that. During World War I, a French soldier was very badly injured. And while he was unconscious, uh, they transported him to the doctors. And his arm was so horribly injured that the surgeon had to amputate it. And so when the soldier woke up, the surgeon very gently told him, Son, I'm sorry, but you've lost your arm. I love what the soldier said. The soldier looked at the surgeon and responded, Sir, I did not lose it. I gave it for France. Now, some would argue with that soldier, right? They would say that France forced the soldier into the war, and so France is responsible for the soldier losing an arm since he had no choice but to fight. And while that's not a perfect analogy, the truth is there have been countless people who refused to go to war. Now, it doesn't always end well for them, but th th plenty of people refuse. And so Jesus had a choice. Now, you might argue, yeah, but if Jesus refused to do it, would that not be a sin? Okay, yes, it would be a sin if he didn't do what God wanted him to do, right? And so we can't fully, we can't hope to fully understand how, uh, how the fact that Jesus was 100% divine and 100% human worked in his life. We don't understand that. But because he was 100% human, just like me and you, Jesus had free will. Jesus could, yes, hear this, Jesus could have said no. Remember in the garden when he was praying, he said, Lord, take this cup from me if it's your will. He could have said no. Jesus wasn't hired to do a job. Jesus existed for this job. More often than not, shepherds were born, not made. As soon as a boy was old enough, he was out in the field learning how to tend the sheep. I mean, that's why the boy existed, right? To love the sheep, to protect the sheep, to provide for the sheep, to heal the sheep, to watch over the sheep, to save the sheep. This is why Jesus is the good shepherd. Amen. Jesus exists to love you. He exists to protect you. He exists to provide for you. He exists to heal for you. He exists to watch over you. He exists to save you. Jesus said in Matthew 20 that he did not come into the world to be served, but to serve. And then he gave the ultimate example of that service. Matthew 20, 28 says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I mentioned that today is Palm Sunday. It's a Sunday we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry on the donkey into Jerusalem, right, a week before he was crucified. But this Sunday is also known as Passion Sunday. And so Passion Sunday is when you choose to focus on the crucifixion, the passion, right? And so preachers can kind of choose which one they want to focus on or they can kind of do both of them. But it's, it's, it's when we either remember his triumphal entry or his sacrifice and death. The death that was a ransom for me and for you. He took the punishment that was meant for me. He took the punishment that was meant for you. Why? Because the Jesus, you're worth it. I'm worth it. Why? Because he's the good shepherd. And that's what good shepherds do. Remember that verse from Psalm 77. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Remember, it says, you led your flock. And so it's God's flock. Jesus' mission was to return us to our creator. We are God's flock. And unfortunately, some of us have wandered off and are headed to a cliff or to possibly be eaten by some wolves. And in our unhappiness and our uncomfortableness, we turn to any shepherd that we can find in order to be safe. You turn to preachers who only tell you what you want to hear. 
You turn to gurus or horoscopes. And what you have either already discovered or you're about to discover is that when the bad times come and church, they are coming, those shepherds are going to abandon you. But even if they tried to fight and protect you, they won't make it very long. Their strength will fail. And none of them can bring us back to the Father. Next week, we're going to be looking at Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we're going to deal with that a bit more next week. But the only way back to our owner, the only way back to our creator, the only way back to our father is being protected and led by the good shepherd. So who's your shepherd? Oh, it's someone. You have, we all have a shepherd. And yes, it could be yourself. You could be a sheep who thinks she's a shepherd. So if that's you, I want to let you in on a little secret today. Your little sheep hooves will never be able to hold a rod nor a staff, and you will never be able to use a sling with those little sheep hooves. You can lie to yourself all you want, but you just don't have the ability to be your own shepherd, and one day you're going to realize it. So let me ask you, do you believe Jesus is a good shepherd? Here's how you can tell if you do. The Pharisees were still not understanding Jesus. And so Jesus said, starting in verse 25, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. <coughs> My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So do you believe that what Jesus did and does proves who he is? Do you know, I mean, know his voice? Church, if you don't, I want nothing else for you than to know the good shepherd. Why? Because as Jesus said, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. The robbers and thieves are going to try. The wolves are going to try time and time and time again. They tried in my own life, as I said this past week. But I've got a sling. I've got a rod. i got a staff protecting me and guiding me. How about you? How safe do you feel where you are? How's that pen you're in? And are you ready for something greater? Are you desperate for the good shepherd? The good shepherd died on the cross for you. He died. This isn't he may die one day or he will die. He has already died died for you. That's why one of the last things he said on the cross was, it is finished. It was finished long before you even began. It's finished. Because he loves you. He laid his life down for you. So do you know the good shepherd? And i got to wrap this up, so forgive me. There's a, there's a lot. It's a big sermon, and I left out a lot. But I do want to say this. The word for no here is not up here. It's not like I know how to write in English, right? Not well, but I do know how to write in English, right? That's I know. What we're talking about here is an intimacy, <laughs> right? It's like a husband knowing his wife, a wife knowing. There's an intimacy here, okay? That's what we're talking about. When the shepherd knows his sheep and the sheep knows their shepherd, is talking about this intimacy. It's not that they can just recognize him. They know him. Do you know the good shepherd? I don't mean have you heard of him. Do you know him intimately? 
So we're going to sing one more song. We're going to pray. But I want to invite you today. If you don't know the Good Shepherd, I want to invite you to go under his staff and into the pit. Because there's freedom in the pit. And I want you to come and experience the freedom that is found in, in the life when you in, found in life when you know the Good Shepherd is watching over you. So today, come and surrender. Walk away from the frauds and the phonies. Walk away from the liars and the schemers. Walk away from the less fans. Walk away from the wolves, the thieves, and the robbers. And surrender everything in your life. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Surrender it all to Jesus Christ. So as I pray and as, as, as we sing, I invite you to come and meet and get to know the Good Shepherd. Because he's here. He's ready. And yes, he's been expecting you. So as we pray and sing, will you come and meet the Good Shepherd? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so very much for your son, the Good Shepherd. Lord, I thank you that you love your flock. And you sent your son, Jesus Christ, in the world to bring your flock back home. Because we had all just wandered away. We, wa we wanted to do our own thing. We wanted to chase after our own dreams. And we, we find ourselves hanging off a cliff. Or we've already, already fallen over the cliff. And we don't know what to do. But you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to chase after us and to bring us home. So, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being a good shepherd. We thank you for correcting us, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for, for wrapping that crook around our neck and, and, and helping change our direction. Lord, we thank you that as we enter the pen, you check us for wounds and you heal us. Lord, I pray right now that if there's anyone in this room who doesn't truly know, intimately know the Good Shepherd, that today they would change that. They would come forward and walk into your pen and experience the freedom that's found there. Pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.